Hello, and welcome back to the Self Healer Soundboard. In the last few episodes, we've been diving into the conditioned mind and our hidden beliefs. And one of the things that is born from those hidden beliefs and that conditioned mind is our inner critic, that inner critical, judgmental, shameful voice that often enters us into a cycle of shame. So we decided to devote an entire episode today to the inner critic and that shame cycle that ensues. I think this is a perfect place to start even introing um, this concept of conditioning, because when we're born, we're not actually born in judgment of or in criticism of ourselves. We're born as, if you've been tuning into the past couple episodes, we've been talking and describing it like a pure state of awareness. Things are ha happening and we're registering those happenings, but we're not necessarily being critical or judgmental. What we are doing, based on an evolutionary drive, if you will, is we are looking and assessing to see how we compare or how we measure up to other people. Because really simply, what we're most you know, prioritizing in that moment are our relationships. Because in childhood, we are dependent on our relationships to make sure that our basic needs are met. So then depending on how safe we feel to really simply be who we are, to register what's happening, to be curious, to make sense of what's happening, we're looking to the world around us for feedback. And oftentimes when our environments aren't safe, when we're not being modeled how to be who we are, we end up feeling shameful about certain beliefs, perspectives, or emotions. And then we become critical and we internalize that voice. And we're going to dive deeper into that. But I think that's an important distinction to make, which is we're born with a tendency to compare though not necessarily to criticize or tear ourselves down or shame ourselves like so many of us learn to do based on our earliest circumstances. And even those hidden beliefs and the voice of that inner critic, which we'll continue into, comes from not that pure state of being or newness when we first enter the world as newborns. It comes from that environment of childhood. It comes from that conditioning. So that critical voice, whether maybe it's the voice you hear in your head telling you you're not good enough or not to go after that thing or leaving you in crippling fear, that voice is the voice of the beliefs and the environment from that earliest childhood. So the inner critic too isn't coming from a pure state of awareness in response to you. It's being critical and responding to those beliefs that were learned and conditioned, really molded into your mind as you were evolving and growing, not necessarily aligned with your true authentic being now. And ultimately, when we kind of internalize the very common beliefs of I'm not worthy, I'm not lovable, these parts of me aren't acceptable, then the, the natural byproduct of that, you know, aimed at keeping ourselves safe, right? If I'm not worthy and lovable and I can't maintain connections, if I express this part of myself, right, it, it can be safer to judge those thoughts, those perspectives or those feelings and judge ourselves out of, right? criticize ourself out of even expressing them. So now I can remain safely connected because what I had learned and the messaging I'd received for so long was how shameful, how to be avoided. Even some of us apply an immorality, right? A badness about some aspects of our being. And so if we do tune more into and allow this critical voice to color, to convince ourselves out of expressing those parts of ourselves, really what we've just done is you brought up fear. We've kept ourselves safe because now I don't have to be vulnerable and I don't have to meet whatever outcome, uncertain outcome it is that might happen or occur when I express this part of myself. So in a, in a very real way, we become locked in a cycle of self-protection, which only continues to strengthen those deep-rooted beliefs. And in what you're describing as being locked in that cycle, we become locked or can become locked in the voice of that inner critic, believing or seeing it as if that voice is who we are, which is why it's so helpful and really so necessary to be able to pull back or to begin practicing pulling back and acknowledging that there is a self that then is hearing this voice. And I get that that might sound to some people, well, I hear voices in my head. Yes, we all hear voices in our head. And I know at least in 
the country that I've grown up in and here in our society, hearing voices and callings or things like that are kind of shunned or tabooed. It's not talked about. It's not really accepted. So I do want to normalize here too that an inner critic is a voice that lives within your mind. That voice is not you, though it is a voice born from your earliest environments to keep you, like Nicole is saying, locked into that cycle. Locking into that cycle is your little bubble of safety. If it can stay in that cycle, it knows what to expect. So while a critical voice is critical and judgmental, it's also not there to harm you or hurt you. Your inner critic is actually in existence to help you. That voice is there in an attempt to keep you safe, to keep you in the same familiar of the past, because if it can know what's coming and what to expect or to keep you small, to keep you fearful, to keep you from stepping outside of the box or pushing through that fear, then it can keep you really controlled and regulated in this safe little invisible bubble. I think what's you know important to note here, and again, speaking from, from my lived experience for a long time, when I would hear or read about or hear other people talk about this, you know, internal my monologue, this critical voice, usually saying pretty mean things. You're unworthy, you're ugly, you're whatever it might be. I couldn't relate to that. I didn't have, or I didn't notice that voice that was kind of being really derogatory um, or again, judgmental in my own head. The way my critical voice talks, actually the predominant way is through shoulds, which I came to realize over time is still based in a self-assessment, right? If I should or shouldn't do something, that's based, that's based in some internalized value system. I brought up the concept of morality earlier, right? And for me, it was all of these ideas of, you know, how I should be in the world, how I should present myself, how other people should experience me, usually aimed at keeping others happy, avoiding disappointment, not understanding that I was still locked in that same cycle because what I was doing beneath the surface was I was having a perspective, a thought, an emotion, and all beneath the surface, I was judging that immediately as shameful, right? As to be denied for whatever reason for me based in my childhood, like most of us. And I was repressing it, suppressing it, keeping it below the surface. So it didn't come out for me like that tearing myself down. It comes out even to this day as those moments where I can hear myself determining what is appropriate or not. Again, based for me in these internalized old beliefs, not necessarily in the objectivity of the moment. And I'm actually, I'm bringing this up, I think, because it's quite top of mind because the shoulds um, have been really prevalent for me recently um, as I've been um, given, you know, as, you know, in general, as I am granted the opportunity to do many things. Um, I have a lot of creative ideas, a lot of things I want to see happening in the world, a lot of opportunities that I'm very gratefully offered. And, you know, in those moments where, because I've, you know, energetically, I just, I don't have the time or I don't have the emotional bandwidth, or I just, I'm overbooked. I have too much happening as I embody the experience of putting up a boundary or of saying no, um, especially around, you know, my, the workbook launch that just happened. I'm in the process of, you know, writing a new book and thinking about promoting that book. And again, given all these opportunities, and I really do have the tendency to maybe watch what other people are doing around their book launches or how packed other people's schedules are. And I hold myself up to that expectation of what I should be doing. For me, always aimed at achievement, always aimed at overpassing. Doesn't matter how much energy I have. Doesn't matter how much time I have. Doesn't matter emotionally how grounded I feel to be able to do whatever thing it is I'm being offered. For me, I have this endless running dialogue of how I should say yes always to every opportunity with then a litany of, you know, I'm not, I'm unworthy. I'm not good enough. Similarly comes up if I don't make that choice. And so for me, these shoulds are really present to this day, even in what for a lot of us might be moments of gratitude, right? Oh, opportunities are great. Yet I'm still holding myself up to sometimes unrealistic expectations around how I can and should show up in those moments. It's been interesting witnessing you in real life in these moments, just particularly this last week where that should that you're describing defaults into a comparison. And what I keep noticing in your sharing here is that 
while you didn't have the that voice, the inner the direct dialogue of you're not X, it was in the form of suppression and in the form of these shoulds. Though with what I've witnessed you experiencing this week and in what you're sharing here in comparing yourself to others, the should does translate into a direct dialogue of I'm not doing enough. So that again is a sneaky way that mm -hmm. that inner critic, what the voice Nicole's not hearing and she's seeing as shoulds is also invisibly in the background, consistently declaring to herself, I'm not doing enough. So-and-so is doing a global world tour and all of these other things. Well, I need to be doing that. And it, it's funny because I sit back I'm like, well, Nicole, you're Nicole. You see all of the things that we have going, all of the books we have out, our membership. We are going to Europe in a couple of weeks for how to do the work. There's so many things happening and that we are creating. And it is just fascinating to sit back and watch you then go into a comparison of these other people because you start to see the others in your network or on your playing field and especially in our work when we are honoring our heart's truth. I'm sitting here doing what I'm doing because this is my life's work. Nicole's life work also happens to be on the same plane. That's why we even merged in the first place. So Nicole is honoring her truth. The other people that she's comparing herself to, knowing who they are, are also living a life where they're honoring their truth. Their livelihood and their career is built on their own life's work and their own authentic truth. And when each of us tune into our own authentic selves and what does light us each up, what is our own genius zone and our own flow, it's going to look wildly different for people. Some people are meant to be parents that stay at home and look after the children. Some are destined to be school teachers. Some are destined to be janitors or in service positions. None of those are on a spectrum of one's better than the other or one has more regard or is more important or more needed. Each person is here. Say there's eight, nine billion of us each with our own genius and our own truth. And it's you tuning into that and following that. And for everyone listening and watching, when you do begin to connect to your own truth, that inner critical voice might rear itself the volume up full speed because now you're doing something new and scary. You're connecting back to that pure state of presence that you came into the world as. When you came into the world in that pure state of presence, your conditioned mind, this inner critic shame, those things literally didn't exist. So imagine now when you choose to connect back to that pure state of being, that is going to send shivers up the spine of shame and your inner critic and that voice because it literally now has no oxygen to breathe. The more you go back to that pureness and that authentic truth, it has no fuel. It has no energy or food to thrive or exist on. So I'm also just, I'm really proud of you. And it's always so interesting to to witness the things that you do beat yourself up about or that you do shame yourself about because it can be so clear to me as the onlooker of what's happening and all that you've created and all that we've created and are creating, yet we're all still human and we all still, whether it's that direct dialogue or not, or it shows up as no voice and in a form of shoulds for you, it's still the same energy and the same communication that we're all experiencing. And thank you, Jenna, for that acknowledgement. And I think concurrently um, in these moments where I'm shooting and I'm suppressing and I'm not allowing my, I'm not allowing myself really to, to honor my authentic truth, whether it's the limits in my, you know, energy or my emotional bandwidth, or maybe just some things aren't for me and won't ever be for me. And, you know, when I'm in those moments of shaming myself, the byproduct of that is then how it's impacted how I do show up in those moments. And I'll be the first to say that when you and I were even recording our last episode on the podcast, I had a mini meltdown mid recording of the podcast. I flung, if you're, any of you are watching <laughs> it was this, the beginning. Took if any of takes. you are watching, you know, <laughs> if any of you tune into our YouTube channel and watch this, we have these microphones. I flung the microphone around. I went spinning. And, you know, cause for me, I, I destabilized the self that I'm confident in that in that moment in time, I didn't even feel like 
I could have Furcon push play. Like, who am I to have a podcast and have anything to say at all? And again, this is an area where I do feel very passionate. I do feel, you know, when I'm speaking, when I'm teaching, when I'm connecting with other people, this is my flow zone. Yet in those moments, I was so destabilized. I was entertaining that critical voice that it actually did impact. And this is exactly how now, if I didn't have that awareness point, if I wasn't able to pull back and say, you know what, Nicole, you're feeling less than. You've been entertaining these narratives. You've been looking at other people. You've been allowing that to impact how you're showing up. I could have just as easily said, well, exactly. You suck. And this is exactly, you can't even do a podcast. So turn, you know, turn your shingle off. Self-healer soundboard doesn't exist anymore and don't even show back up. And that's why I'm endlessly grateful for the mirrors that are you, that are Lolly, that are, you know, the people around me to hold that reflection up, to remind me um, of my power and to give me the opportunity then to step back into that myself. But very quickly, I just wanted to share that because I can see how that cycle really does sneak up and could even sneak up on me. And if I, I would be lying again, if I said I didn't walk into this room here today with a little bit of, I was really leaning into my power, but with a little bit of, oh gosh, I hope that doesn't happen again. And the more we live in that past, in these critical stories, in these shameful moments, and we don't embody these new choices, create a new familiarity, the more we are going to recreate that past right in our present. Because the intention of these episodes is to keep them raw and real and unscripted, I'm going to use right now as a real life example of this concept of this inner critic and shame and it keeping you stuck because the inner critic's mission is to keep you stuck. Stuck means you're not going anywhere. You're in the same surroundings, the same familiar surroundings. That signals so much safety. So often we can keep turning that volume of this critical voice up without even knowing it because the more we hear it, the more we believe it, the more we get to stay in this cozy little stuck cocoon, which over time we start to recognize, wait, something's not feeling right here. There's some resistance because I am staying stuck when my soul and my heart want to express themselves, want to align with their true self, and want to put that out into the world. Our true self and that pure being don't align with this inner critical nature or that judgment. It's in a pure state of harmony and of wholeness. So as we're just sitting here and I'm listening to Nicole sharing, she kind of completes talking and cuts over to me. And for the last 10 minutes, I'm like, I don't know what the hell to say. Like I got so lost just listening to you. And I can feel in my body a lot, a lot of just tingling and like hot sensations swirling around. And all of that just came rushing to the surface as Nicole finished talking before I could even formulate words. My body was already there. So through the witnessing of the wisdom, this is that Nietzsche quote I like, there is more wisdom in your body than in your deepest philosophy. I was able just now to witness my body, have a little five minute, I don't know what the hell to say, tantrum with Furkan and Nicole here, and then start to clue in, well, I know when that's coming up, there's clearly something there. There's shame here right now. There's this inner critical voice here right now saying, why the hell are you on a podcast? What are, what are you here for? I see all of the old reviews, especially from season one, when I was brand new to this podcast with Nicole, we didn't have a plan. We just wanted to serve and put how to do the workout in a free masterclass. And if you tune in or have listened to season one, you'll know what I'm referring to. There's a stark difference in season one and season two in our connection, in our flow. We tried to script season one. I talk and kind of ramble a lot at certain points. There was no, it just wasn't our best work. And that's okay because it was our work in present time then. We did that to be of service even though the critical voices were there. So even 91 episodes in now to season two, it's not like that critical voice has magically disappeared or those shame cycles aren't there. It's very much still present, though what's also present is a choice to show up in service to myself and to you through that fear, with an understanding now, too, that on the other side of 
that fear is my heart's truth, is living authentically. And it takes a lot of courage to be able to do that. So the goal is never, at least for me, and I suggest as well, never to set yourself up to eradicate this voice of shame or this inner critic, but to understand that it is there for a reason. And when it does come and we begin to notice it, because that's the first step, noticing that we also have the power to shift our focus away from it. If we breathe energy into cultivating this critical voice and this shameful voice, we strengthen that within ourselves. Strengthening shame and that criticism internally with ourselves actually weakens us. It weakens us emotionally and it weakens our physical body. So at any moment when you notice shame or notice that inner critical voice or judgment, right there is your opportunity to practice shifting into a loving voice or shifting into just even presence in the moment, maybe not picking a new thought, but just turning your attention away or the volume down from the critical and shameful thought. So even hearing you, you know, very beautifully use the word um, weakening, right? We're weakening ourselves and going back to this, this concept of stuck and revisiting this last podcast episode. So an extension of what was happening behind the scenes for me, um, in addition to having my tantrum, deeming myself, you know, incapable of being here, there was another voice. And I want to share this because I think it also illustrates another sneaky way that our inner critic pops up. There was a concurrent voice at the same time that was seeking to criticize you. Jenna, and make you somehow the issue or the problem. Oh, I felt it. The issue or the problem. I'm sure you did. I was going to say, I'm sure that wasn't lost in a a moment or two for the demise of this episode and this entire podcast. And for me, I know I very much have a habitual tendency to externalize blame, to make everyone around me, the circumstances that weren't ideal, the cause for how I showed up without realizing all of the choices that I've been making that you've been witness to over the past week or two that have done nothing but destabilize me, weaken me. And until I turned and took responsibility, and again, knowing that that's my habitual pattern to criticize someone else, making them the cause for my performance or my way of being, that very then much like you're describing gave me the opportunity to regain my power by saying, no, Nicole, this isn't how other people are showing up or what they're doing or not doing or the temperature in the room or whatever else that you've created to be the cause. This is all of those little choices that I just described to you earlier that were leading me to have too much volume on that I'm not enough, I'm unworthy, that critical voice. And my performance was a reflection of me, of no one else but myself. So when we understand that, we can empower ourselves to be a participant, to say, you know what, it's not out there what's happening. All of this is my internal monologue, my deep-rooted fears, this deep-rooted sense of unworthiness. And if I locate then all of that as being the cause or the origin, now I have the opportunity to create change because I don't have to be reliant on the person I'm working with showing up in a particular way for me to feel better about how I'm feeling. The more I make space for myself, which might not look in presenta- in presentation like the global world tour- tours that I maybe see someone else doing. If I learn just to stay committed or if I continue to stay committed to who I am and how I want to best be of service and what's aligned for me, then I continue to remain empowered. It won't matter what everyone else is doing. It won't matter how you're showing up in here. I'll, I will be able to accept who I am and how I am in more moments than not. There's also an unconscious expectation, I think, that happens where you don't notice that even if the other person is showing up exactly how you want and need them to be, like our last recording, there will still be a filter or a layer that you're first seeing that goes to a direct blame. Of course, they're the problem, even if they're doing exactly what I want and need them to do do or to be or what I expected them to do or how to be because you're not connected over here with self first. So it doesn't matter what your (laughs) surroundings are or aren't because you're going to see them as wrong anyways. And it makes a lot of sense because we scan we scan and filter blame out to others. At least it makes a lot of sense to me because to 
take responsibility for ourselves, to hold up a mirror to ourselves, and to be willing to say, you know what, this is actually me. This is me projecting this outward. That takes a lot. It takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of accepting of a lot of uncomfortable thoughts and physical feelings. So that's what I, when I say it makes sense, well, of course, humans don't immediately want to do that uncomfortable thing or that thing that makes them maybe physically feel sick. That's all really threatening. So we do default to this blame outward and external because Pulling the mirror up and shining it in front of our own selves means there's no more running. When you see all parts of yourself, especially and particularly the parts of yourself that you have shunned for so long or denied or are least proud of, those parts also happen to be the fuel and the energy and the lifeline really of that inner critic. So I really appreciate you sharing that and that that happened in general, because I could feel and hear and see that that blame or disdain of this is over there because of you. And while you were experiencing that stuckness for a moment, my own inner critic and all of this dialogue and ridicule went into a blame game of if someone around me is anything but pleasant and happy, I must be the source and the cause of whatever's happening over there for them. And I sat here in this very chair and went through a whole litany of questions in my mind of like, you know, how did I screw up? What did I do? What's going on? How are we not flowing? And I really got to sit with myself for a moment and realize, no, I, I am in my pure essence. I am present. I am here and was able to, you know, step out of the room with you and show up and support you in a way that felt so connecting. And I think actually helped us grow closer in that moment because I then got to show up for myself as a new version of me. I saw the storm of that inner critic and blame game happen over here for me. And I also then witnessed myself show up for myself and in relationship with you in a completely different environment and realize that all of the noise of that blame and critical voice that came in for me was all just remnants of the past. And it was a great teaching moment for me, and it really a great moment to mark my own growth and my own evolution. So thank you. I'm so appreciative, Jenna, for you in that moment, because you were able to be that kind of secure point to restabilize me, to actually pull me outside of myself and remind me in, in a lot of ways who I am and what I am capable of. Because what I was stuck in is that old self, that cyclone of shame and you know, all of that, that criticism and feeling less than, and it's not my fault and feeling helpless and powerless on top of it. And in that moment, you gave me that vantage point that I couldn't have. And so for all of you out there, you know, who do have those, you know, supportive people in your life, whether or not it's a romantic partnership or friends, I mean, one of the biggest reasons why the self-healer circle exists now is to create a community where these supportive connections can be made. And in those moments, they can be incredibly invaluable to have that stability, that rock in a sense. I think I actually called you. Thank you for being the rock for us in that episode because that was the difference between me continuing on that spiral and us being able to come back in to record an episode that actually turned out and I hope is a value for all of you when you listen to that. And of course, this isn't to say that we can't provide ourselves with that stability. Sometimes it means leaving the room, maybe if there's something that's, you know, highly activating happening, or maybe just leaving our minds for a second. If you're caught in that endless critical shame spiral of judgmental thoughts, the difference might mean going and taking a walk and just refocusing your attention, not on those thoughts. And you might have to do it moment by moment on the feeling of your body, your muscles on that walk around the block or whatever it might be that might give you that stable, secure base to remind yourself of who you are and all of who you are. And while you might feel inundated by these, you know, critical ideas of yourself in that moment, giving yourself the opportunity to return back to the more expansive being that is each and every one of you. So thank you again for being that for me last week. And I couldn't agree more that, you know, this is in these moments when they do happen within a relationship. This is what builds security in trust, right? I, because there is a give and take. There might be a moment, and I'm sure there will be moments in the future where 
I'm able to be that more stable base for Jenna. And the more we reciprocate that, the more both of us gain trust, not only in our personal lives together, but in our professional lives together. Now there's a sense of security that, you know what, I can and probably will fumble, not feel so great, you know, at a future podcast recording. And I have a teammate, I have a collaborator, I have someone else in the moment who can help restabilize both of us, the relationship or the task at hand. So again, I just want to say thank you. And I do want to remind everyone listening that, you know, if you don't have that supportive person, um, you know, in physical form, embodiment next to you or in access to you, understanding that the virtual landscape is a great place to begin to find these connections, you can create that space for yourself. And it all begins bringing this beautifully full circle. You can begin this journey by first simply noticing. I imagine the large majority of you listening probably will notice some version of a critical voice, whether it's the demeaning, mean nature of self-criticism or, again, in these shoulds, in this more implicit act or beneath the surface act of suppression. If we didn't have the safety, again, to just live in our awareness, express ourself, chances are we're criticizing ourselves in some way, in some relationship, and in some aspect of our being. And as we notice, we can create more space. We can surrender into acceptance to who we are, and then we can regain our power so that that is then who we are living in self-expression, whatever relationship that is in. The irony is that the example we just gave you from our recording of the last episode was an episode on beliefs. <laughs> and that episode was following an episode on the conditioned mind. And I'm referencing that because if you haven't listened to those two previous episodes, I highly suggest tuning into them. They really circle in with this one. All of the episodes really are there is a common thread through all of them, and it's the conditioned mind where all of those beliefs live. And our critical voice and that shameful voice is the voice of those beliefs, which are beliefs that we inherited. They're not beliefs that we truly think about ourselves, that we came into the world as a little newborn baby thinking and declaring. They were ones that we learned. So all of that shame, too, and that voice that's coming in, that's not your voice. That is a learned mechanism, a protective mechanism. And when you can see that separate from who you are, at the very least, begin practicing and affirming to yourself that I am not shame. I am not the critical voice. I do have this critical voice, and it's actually here to protect me. We can just allow and create space for all parts of us because very likely the parts of us that are being triggered and wounded, connected to that inner voice are the parts of us that we're most embarrassed or humiliated by or that we want to keep back in the dark the most. And because of that, they are like raging to get to the surface. When we create our own safe container to just allow that voice to be, realize where it came from, why it's there, that it's not actually us, it's just a part of us, then we can start to take the the morality, the good, the bad, and really all of the drama away from it and start to look at everything from a space of neutrality and really a space of objectivity where everything we're discussing is feedback, it's information, it is wisdom to teach us about ourselves. So thank you for tuning in to this episode and those previous episodes if you already have listened we always appreciate your feedback, hearing how these are landing for you, what your take on these conversations are. So please leave us a review on Apple, drop us a comment on YouTube or like our channel, subscribe to our channel. We are committed to putting this podcast out ad-free always for your viewing and listening experience. So your sharing, your engagement, and your connection with us here around these conversations is so deeply appreciated and valued and really helps us bring these conversations around the globe for all to partake. We love you and we'll see you next week.